Great. Good afternoon. Welcome to the April 18th, 2018 special meeting of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Uh, call a roll. Uh, Commissioner Lee? Here. Commissioner Kopp? Here. Commissioner Rennie? Here. Commissioner Ryan? Here. Um, wanted to uh, welcome Judge Kevin Ryan, who was uh, recently appointed to the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Um, we're delighted to have you join us. Thank you. And um, welcome to uh, your, your very first meeting. So, uh, agenda item number two is uh, public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda. Oh, uh, but before then, I, I do want to note that this meeting, uh, we have a time constraint. We need to be vacated from this room by 4.15 this afternoon uh, because we will turn into a pumpkin otherwise. And so in order to uh, allow for the uh, vote on the ACAO, the Anti-Corruption and Accountability Ordinance, um, we will be voting on that by no later than 4 o'clock today in order to allow for public comment following uh, following that vote for the last agenda item. So uh, without further ado, we'll turn to uh, public comment on agenda item number two. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Charlie Marsteller with Friends of Records for the, uh, Friends of Ethics for the Record. Um, I was gonna say I just woke up from my nap. <laughs> uh, I welcome Commissioner Ryan, Friends of Ethics is welcome to see you aboard. And, um, I was going to also suggest now with two commissioners rec of recent vin vintage, uh, the commission staff might consider a kind of a workshop to brief the commissioners and the public on our scopes of uh, mission, our mandates, um, the laws that we administer, and other uh, related items to, um, with packets, I'm sure, uh, plenty of paper, to detail for the commission and the public the work that we've been doing now for uh, 22 years, 23 years. And uh, now we're on a roll. I think that's more es essential than ever because we are actually been very active the last several years um, since we've got a new executive director and a much larger staff based on a strategic plan. So um, that would be our suggestion. This is a, a recommendation by Friends of Ethics. Thank you. Commission, good afternoon. Uh, let me introduce oh, uh, Could you yeah, speak into the microphone, please? Thank you. Okay. Let me introduce myself. My name is Julian Munoz. I'm a native San Franciscan. Uh, I res currently reside and have always resided on Bernal Heights here in the city. Um, I'm an architect. <clears throat> I designed two terminals, at the SFO. I co-founded a leading software company 30 years ago, uh, which has 3,000 governmental clients across the nation. I'm also an Olympic athlete, uh, was involved in the 2012 SF bid for the Summer Olympics here in San Francisco. I'm here to support the candidacy of Mr. Quentin Kopp as president of your distinguished commission. Uh, I have followed uh, Mr. Kopp very closely in his various walks of life, being a member of the Board of Supervisors, as a state senator, and lastly as a judge, and of course a member of this, this uh, distinguished commission. I find him to be a very fair and impartial individual that will bring his outstanding values to fulfill the commission's mission statement. I hope that you, as members of the commission, will also recognize his strengths and be able to bring uh, his strengths to the var various determinations that you will make here uh, during your respective uh, tenures. I respectfully thank you again for this opportunity to offer my support for Mr. Kopp as chair of the commission. Thank you. Hello, I'm Erica Byrne. I meant to come a long time ago, ever since the mayoral election at which David Chu ran for mayor. Um, I was disenfranchised from that election because there were so many um, candidates and so few spots on the ballot that everybody who voted for all women did not get a 
chance to vote on the final two candidates. Everyone who voted for Harvard alumni did not get a chance to vote for the final two candidates. So I was just concerned with another mayoral election coming up that this problem has been addressed and taken care of. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, being none, moving on to agenda item number three. Discussion and possible action to elect a chair and vice chair to serve for the coming year. There is uh, an attachment, um, number three, but with background. So based on past practice, I'll give a brief walkthrough of the process. So any commissioner who wishes to nominate a candidate for chair will state the name of that person. If that person agrees to run, that person is nominated. And any member may nominate him or herself. When there are no further nominations, we'll take public comment. And after public comment, um, as acting chair, I will close the nominations. Um, and then I will then ask the executive director for a roll call vote in which each commissioner shall state the name of the nominee for whom he or she is voting. If a nominee receives three or more votes, that person is then elected chair. If no nominee receives three votes, the commission will, may have then further discussion and proceed to another vote. Um, the process shall repeat until one nominee has received three or more votes. Um, so <clears throat> as acting chair, um, I'll go ahead and uh, open the nominations for chair. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I uh, nominate uh, acting chair to as the next uh, permanent chair which is in accordance with the procedures and practices that this commission has followed at least as long as I've been on it that uh, it uh, the vice chairs were uh, unless there was some overriding reason the vice chairs were moved to become chair and and we then elect a new vice chair. So I put Chair Commissioner Chu in nomination. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Rennie. I uh, would happily s <coughs> accept the nomination. Um, Commissioner Lee? I second the motion, and I just want to add that um, during the um, um, short tenure that I've been here, I've um, known the uh, vice chair uh, to, to be a person of high integrity and honor and uh, very open to different ideas and, and um, um, open to working with all sectors in the city. And uh, she has led this commission uh, during the last uh, few months with distinction, so I am honored to second the motion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Lee. I, I, from a procedural standpoint, I don't believe a second is ne necessary. Yeah. Um, any other nominations? Um, Madam Executive uh, Director, would you uh, please call the roll? And uh, if I as, uh, as uh, noted earlier, I think that it's not a yay or nay vote, but it's it, it would be the uh, it, since there's only one nomination, then. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead, proceed. <laughs> I think after, if the nominations are closed, then at this point we would proceed to public comment. Oh yes, that's right, sorry. And then after public comment, proceed to a roll call vote. Right, okay, so uh, nominations are closed and uh, now there's public comment. <clears throat> uh, Friends uh, does not have a position on this, but I would say this, that, um, uh, I know we have a vice chair nomination which follows this process. So the public should be advised that um, we will be electing two officers of the body today, the chair and the vice chair. So uh, that may uh, assuage the interest of a new member of a public who's dropped in today. And it's always good to see new members of the public. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? There being none, uh, Madam Executive Director. Uh, thank you. If commissioners, uh, I'll call names alphabetically, and if you would just please state the name of the individual for whom you're voting. Uh, Commissioner Chu? Dana Chu. Commissioner Kopp? No. 
Commissioner Lee? Chu. Commissioner Rene? Chu. And Commissioner Ryan? Chu. Thank you. With uh, four votes and one no vote, uh, commission, Commissioner Chu is elected president of the commission for the coming year. Thank you for that. Thank you. And now um, I'd like to open nominations for vice chair. I would not, <coughs> uh, Madam Chair, I would nominate uh, Commissioner Kopp. Uh, I would also nominate Commissioner Kopp. And so would I. Any other nominations? Okay, nominations are now closed. Uh, public comment. And uh, Madam Chair, can we confirm uh, from Commissioner Kopp that he is uh, willing to serve as the past practice has uh, indicated nominees uh, confirm? Uh, Commissioner Kopp, uh, will you confirm that you are willing to serve as vice chair? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. What did he say? He said yes, he's willing oh. to serve <laughs> as vice chair. Thank you. I hoped he would. I hope so, too. And I'm sorry, now public comment was called? Uh, public, is there any public comment now that Commissioner Kopp has uh, affirmed his desire to serve as vice chair? No public comment? No public comment. Okay, and we'll proceed with the roll call vote. I, again, I will call the members in order of uh, alphabetic, alphabetical order. Uh, Commissioner Chu? Kopp. Commissioner Kopp? Aye, Kopp. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Lee? Kopp. Commissioner Rennie? Kopp. And Commissioner Ryan. Judge Kopp. Thank you. With the unanimous vote, Judge, um, Judge Kopp is elected vice chair of the commission. Thank you for your... Assistance. Thank you. Okay. Um, Judge Kopp, I look forward to serving with you in the coming year. Uh, agenda item number four, consideration and possible action on anti-corruption and accountability ordinance as amended on April 3rd, 2018 at the Ethics Commission special joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors to amend the Campaign and Governmental Conduct Code to institute campaign finance and conflict of interest reforms. See Board of Supervisors file number 180280, as well as the attachments from uh, the st staff. <clears throat> so as many of you have been with us on this long journey, we started over a year ago uh, with uh, this anti-corruption and accountability ordinance, and it took many forms uh, and went through a lot of public discussion and, and, um, and debate amongst the commission. And at the end of November, we forwarded a proposal, a uh, proposed ordinance to the Board of Supervisors for their consideration. And um, they met in budget committee in February to consider it and asked uh, for more time. And uh, at the February meeting, the commission voted to, voted to work with the Board of Supervisors in a legislative process uh, to, uh, to uh, cooperate and collaborate to uh, enact this ordinance into law. And we had the unique opportunity earlier this month on April 3rd to meet jointly with the Board of Supervisors uh, to uh, approve uh, the ordinance and we the commission uh, voted on an ordinance and submitted it to the Board of Supervisors, and they uh, accepted our, our uh, ordinance and uh, enacted several amendments, uh, which we are now considering here today. They approved it by uh, their supermajority provision of uh, eight elevenths, and now the ball is in our court as a commission to consider the ordinance, uh, consider both the uh, changes uh, and amendments that the Board of Supervisors have made, and whether there are any changes, additional changes that we would like to make before sending it back to the Board of Supervisors. In order for the ordinance to become um, to become law, it needs to go back to the Board of Supervisors um, for their approval. And today, uh, any amendments that need to be uh, that we would consider uh, would need a three-fifths vote. Uh, to amend the ordinance, but in order to approve the overall ordinance uh, as revised or amended and to send it back to the Board of Supervisors, we would need a four-fifths uh, supermajority vote. So uh, with that by way of background, um, I'd like to just talk for a moment about the process. Um, I would like for uh, any amendments that commissioners are considering to be uh, presented 
uh, in our uh, discussion component um, as part of the uh, commission discussion uh, before we open it to public comment, which will uh, occur uh, once and on mass uh, for the entire uh, item as a whole. So um, staff has prepared some materials, and uh, I would like to invite staff to present uh, their uh, recommendations <laughs> and we as a commission can discuss uh, madam uh, chairwoman are we going to vote on uh, the amendments uh, Sari Adam uh, we can yes uh, I don't believe that's required Okay. It isn't a question of whether it's required. Are we going to be able to vote on the proposed amendments, Sari Adam? I, I believe some I may want to vote for, some I may want to vote against. I, I, yeah, I think that's a question for the chair. Y yes, I think we can vote on them. Mm -hmm. so, yes, we can vote on them, Seriatim, in order to uh, ac accomplish All right. what we need to get accomplished. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. I'll, Ford? Sure, yeah, I'll provide some context. Uh, Pat Ford, policy analyst. Um, the staff's memo that's attached here to the agenda item gives a very brief summary of the various amendments that were approved by the Board of Supervisors at the joint meeting on April 3rd. Um, you'll find them in section three and they're lettered, letter A through I. And I will not run through each of them individually since we are limited in the amount of time we have today, uh, but staff are available to answer any questions that you may have about them. Uh, uh, and then additionally, section four in the memo lists three amendments that staff is proposing on top of the amendments that were made by the board. These are really um, in the nature of technical cleanup amendments. They do not make substantive changes. The three that are printed here in the memo, A through C, um, or rather A, A and B, um, are um, to basically correct section cross-references. C is an amendment that was actually proposed initially by Supervisors Tang and Peskin. They did not propose this amendment at the joint meeting. However, they subsequently communicated with us that that had been their intention, but that in the rush at the end of the meeting that they were not able to or failed to, for whatever reason, make this amendment. Um, so they requested that the commission please pass this amendment and, and include this into the ordinance. So we have included it here as one of our recommended staff um, amendments, although this one would, would be substantive in nature, it does alter um, the behested payment reporting by um, slightly changing the public appeals exception, changing the numbers um, of how many people have to be present at a group for, in order for it to be a public appeal when you speak to the group, and also how many uh, individual items you must distribute in order for it to constitute a public appeal. Uh, but this would mirror what's in the uh, public appeal exception in Article 1, Chapter 1 of the ordinance, so staff is putting it here as a recommended change um, that was requested by those supervisors. And then additionally, it's not in the memo because we were still working with Supervisor Kim's office on this at the time of uh, finalizing the memo, but staff is also recommending some changes to Supervisor Kim's amendments that she made. Um, you'll remember at the joint meeting, Supervisor Kim had three different amendments um, that she wanted to add, and each of them used the term electronic media technologies the intent was that for um, section 1.110 that talks about campaign statements, financial statements, uh, and section 1.162 that talks about uh, submitting copies of electioneering communications, she wanted to specify that in both of those instances, communications that are made electronically need to be included in, in both of those reports, in, in financial statements and in electioneering communication reports. Um, staff was working with her office to try and develop a, a way to do that that was a little bit clearer, and we weren't able to finish that until after this memo went out. Um, so we have distributed to each of you individually, and it's also available uh, for the public, um, our amendments that would go on top of Supervisor Kim's 
that would change the language, to not use the defined term electronic media technologies, but would rather just refer to communications that were distributed electronically. Andrew, get me one of those. I don't know if I've got it here with all this paper. So I apologize for the late change there, uh, but it was something that we were trying to work with Supervisor Kim's office on to make sure that, that they were apprised of it. Um, so that's why it's not here, but glad to answer so, your question. Uh, if I may, a, a clarifying question about the communications you ha you have had with Supervisor Kim's office. So, uh, this was her proposed amendment that was adopted by the board, and now we are we are uh, going to be changing it. And they, are they aware of our uh, proposed changes? Yes, uh, we have shared the text of our proposed changes with their office. We have not been able to get a final determination from Supervisor Kim uh, as to how she feels about the changes. We've only been able to speak with staff in her office. Um, so I can't say with certainty um, what her opinion is on this. Right, but certainly her, her office has been on notice that, and they're aware that this is that we're considering this today. That's correct. Yeah, I did share with them that we would be recommending these specific changes to you today. Okay. What you. What is the specific change? Sure. So the specific change, if you if you want to look at the handout that that actually has it on here. Right. So firstly, is to delete the definition of electronic media technologies. We, we would not like to use this defined term. We think that it, it, it is unnecessarily narrow um, because it leaves out um, electronic communications like text message and email. Um, and we don't believe that was the, in, the intent. Uh, we, we think that all electronic communications were uh, intended to be included here. So we don't want to use this term. Um, and then also changing the way that um, the references in the substantive provisions of the code are. So for section 1.110 that's here on the first page, changing this um, so that it doesn't reference electronic media technologies, but instead just says that electronic communications must be reported on campaign statements. So fixing that each time it, it appears, changing it to, to be that kind of more general invocation of electronic communications. And you're recommending that that should be the language in whatever we send back to the Board of Supervisors? Yes, exactly. Um, the idea being that it still keeps the, the intent and the effect of Supervisor Kim's amendments, but changing it so that it works better in the code. Right. And then the, uh, the next change would be to, in section 1.162, remove that term. This is now on page two of the separate handout. Remove the term uh, on line 15, electronic media technologies. Again, just stating more broadly, communication distributed electronically. And then on the next page, this is something we're actually recommending that should be added. Um, Supervisor Kim made an amendment to the language in 1.162 that is exactly mirrored in section 1.163. So now that duplication would be disrupted. If you change it in 1.162, not in 1.163, and these, these should be the same. It's the same type of reporting where when you file a report, be it an electioneering communication report or a member communication report, you must submit a copy of the communication with the report. That's what this section does. So if you change it in one place and not in the other place, it creates disharmony, could potentially lead to uh, inference that there are different reporting requirements when they're not, that perhaps member communications don't have to be reported if they're electronic. We, we don't want that to be uh, the appearance in the code. So we're recommending that the language be mirrored. So the, exactly the change that would go in 162 should also go in 163 if, if it's gonna be done. It should be done both places. Um, so that's what that is. Uh, and then on the final page, just adding that reference uh, to 163 in the section that talks about the operative date. Um, so 163 would be something that goes into effect January 1, 2019. Um, along with 162. So that's, that's comprehensive of, of our recommended changes um, that are in the memo and those that occurred after the memo. So glad to answer any questions um, that you may have about that. Uh, Commissioner Rennie. Uh, com uh, Madam Chair, I would move that the commission accept the recommendations of the staff and to send back to the Board of Supervisors the revised ordinance, which is consistent with what they sent to us and consistent with the suggested changes by the staff. Second from uh, Commissioner Lee. Commissioner Kopp. Through the chair, this 
You're just talking about changing the language about electronic communications. Correct. Nothing more. Uh, correct. Yeah. Our, our All right. Change here. Okay. Yes. I'm prepared to vote. Okay. Uh, any other comments or from uh, commissioners? Well, we need to do take. Right. Uh, just to clarify the procedure, Chair Chu, is it your intention to get in any other amendments uh, to be proposed by commissioners on yes. the floor this time? Yes. So, are there, uh, do commissioners or Commissioner Kopp, do you are you uh, wanting to present any of your other amendments at, at this time, during during this time, to as we discuss the, the uh, uh, ordinance before public comment? Um, why don't you take public comment on this one? And <coughs> there may be a couple others. I'm sorry. I'm yes. Well, I want a definition of uh, the word promptly in section uh, of. 1.114, uh, subsection F. So, I'm sorry, it's section uh, 1.114, subsection F. So, this would be mm -hmm. page 5. Page, I don't know. There's so many versions of this. It's my page 3. Your, okay, so on your, on your proposed... Amendment. It's page three. No, it, it's page five. You're correct. Page five. Page five. Which line? You did supply through the chair. Uh, you did supply a definition of that, didn't you? I can't find that one nice. page you gave me at the beginning of the meeting. So to clarify, I believe uh, Commissioner Cops. I have okay. All right, you, you want to? You recommend, or you don't recommend, but you say it can be clarified via regulation. Right, uh, but just to aid the discussion, I believe Commissioner Cop is speaking to a language that appears on page five, line twenty-two. Of what? Page five of what? The the larger document with the blue and yellow highlighting that was included in your agenda packet. Okay, I see. Page 5, line 22, first word. Thank, Thank you. So, Commissioner Kopp, did you want to amend the ordinance, or? I would prefer, but I will, I suppose, uh, for speeds uh, in dealing with this, let it be done by regulation. But it is an inexact word. All right. And uh, can we have such a regulation next month? Okay. With that. Uh, okay. So next month, we uh, will, you'll have a regulation finding promptly. Uh, huh? Yeah. So just confirming with staff that at. at yes. All right. Then with that. Uh, on page uh, seven. Just for okay, the record, just, if I, just to clarify for a moment. Just one clarifying record for scheduling purposes. The next meeting is scheduled for May 7th. Under our regulations, we need to have a 15-day notice, so we may not be able to make it for the May meeting, but we can make it's an early meeting, but we could do it certainly for the June meeting. Well, just want, uh, the regulation. Am, I am I correct and assume we won't make regulations until the Board of Supervisors has approved it and it becomes law? Isn't, isn't that correct? <laughs> so that uh, that uh, I yeah. I agree that we should promptly make the the regulations as soon as it becomes law. But I would say, Commissioner Cop, that word promptly was in the version that we sent to the board, and uh, and I guess we some somewhere the nitpicking has got to stop, and. Get this thing on so, in the books. 
Commissioner Kopp? Yeah, through the chair, I don't consider it nitpicking. Well, I'm sorry. I I am, that. Uh, if I am subjected to this uh, ordinance or if I am a professional dealing with this ordinance, I don't know what the heck promptly means. Promptly to uh, employee A may mean something different than employee B. Okay, so at such time as this And I regret that I didn't catch it before. So at such time as the ordinance goes into effect, then we would direct staff and request that they promptly draft a definition and promulgate it by regulation and that it can be agendized and shared with the commission at the next practical meeting. Does that work, Commissioner Cobb? Yes. Okay. Uh, the next one's on page seven, lines eight and nine. Uh, I propose a change of language uh, to state the office and the name of the city elective officer uh, in uh, place of the phrase uh, the name of the city elective officer. So it would read, must disclose to the committee receiving the contribution the office and the name. And the name of the city elective officer. I'll move that as an amendment. If it's right. appropriate to do so now. I'll, I'll second. Are there other changes that you would propose? Uh, let me see this. All right, I think that uh, is it. So, did you, page seven, line eight and nine, did you get the change for that? Okay. <clears throat> any other comments or proposed changes or amendments from any commissioners before we go to public comment? Well, uh, all right, I will uh, move. Uh, has this been distributed to other commissioners? Yes, okay. All commissioners have received uh, the subject matter of uh, my motion to amend section 3.203 and uh, subsequent uh, sections to restore the original language of 2000, which prohibited uh, behest uh, donations uh, at the request of a city elective officer or a member of a board or commission. The nub of the language is on page two of what staff has distributed uh, in section 3.207 section, subsection A, sub subsection uh, four, no city elective officer or member of a board or commission may directly or by any means of an agency solicit or otherwise request that a person give anything of value to a third party if the person who is the subject of the request has a matter pending before the official, his or her agency, or the official has final approval authority over the matter or the person who was the subject of the request had a matter before the official or his or her agency within the last 12 months, uh, and that this section shall not prohibit any uh, solicitations or requests made solely through 
a public uh, a appeal. Uh, and obviously the reason for it is the same as it was uh, 18 uh, years ago and uh, the same as it was in 2017 when unfortunately uh, such provision was removed on a three to two vote by uh, uh, members uh, or failed because of a three to two vote uh, by this commission uh, last uh, December. Uh, without a prohibition, this is a toothless ordinance. As far as that subject matter is concerned, I'll repeat that mere disclosure and mere disclosure of an amount which is a tremendous amount of money for a donation uh, has uh, the promise of no effect whatsoever for members of the public. And I will reiterate that the only people who will note that disclosure, besides those making it uh, for $10,000 or more, will be political junkies, campaign managers, uh, administrative assistants uh, in campaigns, and maybe, maybe, the media, which there is less and less of in uh, San Francisco. And uh, I note, as I think I've noted before, that this is a big business in terms of the city budget. Nonprofit entities are given almost $1 billion out of the city budget in the fiscal year 2017-2018, and it has been noted in public testimony before this uh, uh, commission, uh, uh, a great percentage of those recipients do not render direct services to beneficiaries, but are association of member nonprofit entities which uh, may render direct services to beneficiaries in the city and county of San Francisco and elsewhere, as a matter of fact. Anyway, uh, that's the reason for the amendment, which uh, is consistent with what we started with uh, in 2017 namely the restoration of the so-called Proposition J from uh, the year 2000. Okay, so I believe we have three motions right before us, but that will take public comment before voting on them, right, but I have three. Right, so um, I'm not sure if that last amendment yet has a second. And in addition, I believe if you look at the same documents that Commissioner Kopp was referencing, there's a yeah. another proposed amendment. Is what? I you, believe there's you, another proposed amendment you wish to There's amendment number two. Are you also proposing the change in, in to the, the same document. penalties? And that was the one dealing with the private right of action and then 25%. Oh, you mean the uh, yeah. so-called key TAM provision? Right. I wasn't sure whether you wanted to proceed with it, but it, the language has been prepared. Now let's to... make that separate. Okay. Okay, so your current motion is to contained here in amendment number one to make the changes to section 3.203 and uh, section 3.207. Mm-hmm. Okay, is there a second? What, what are the changes that, that you're talking oh. about? Uh, in, uh, uh, well, I, it's mean, hopeful. I, amendment number oh. one is the changes to the behested payments here would be to, to, to go back to oh, okay. behested payment ban. I, as a courtesy to Commissioner Kopp, I will second it uh, and note that I voted for it in the original uh, provision, 
but the effect of that was to essentially kill the whole bill. And uh, <coughs> the and when we deleted, <laughs> or we, <coughs> excuse me, when we revised that <coughs> and took out the <coughs> the language that you now want to insert, when we took that out, we finally could get four votes, sent it down to the board of supervisors. Uh, you you made an attempt to make that same amendment at the Board of Supervisors and it lost uh, because there wasn't a second and I felt that that it, I didn't second it because I felt it was certainly going to lose under any circumstances <coughs> or if it passed it was going to kill the whole bill and my I presently I'm going to vote against that amendment because what I want us to do tonight is to approve what the Board of Supervisors sent to us with the amendments that were made and suggested by the staff, <coughs> none of which are substantive and which I am reasonably certain will be acceptable to the Board of Supervisors so that we can send it down, get them to approve it. They've approved it unanimously with their amendments, and I have no reason to believe they won't uh, approve it again unanimously when it goes, <coughs> excuse, me. <coughs> excuse me, when it goes back to them. But I don't have that confidence if we were to now make this major change, uh, which uh, we all know was the stumbling block to getting any legislation. And I think it's more important to get what we have. And if experience shows that it doesn't, isn't effective, there's nothing that stops this commission from provoke, proposing and putting on the ballot revisions that uh, deal with the inadequacies. Any other commissioners? Yeah, I just have a uh, question um, to the chair through the maybe uh, for the staff. For my benefit, I met with staff this afternoon. Could you just briefly summarize the uh, the the procedure that was followed for <laughs> the uh, this particular amendment? My understanding is that originally the staff was in favor of the prohibition. There was extensive public comment after that, and then the uh, commission <coughs> voted uh, not for prohibition, but uh, to, for restriction, I think, is uh, currently where we are. Could you just, for my edification, tell me the procedural history of this? Not, I don't need a long description of it, just a short one. Uh, actually, uh, Commissioner, I believe you explained it pretty well. Okay. Um, that uh, we initially considered a uh, ban, as you said, on uh, types of behest payments where um, there was a, an interest between the official and a person that had business before that official. Um, but after significant public comment and through a, a vote of the commission, we um, were directed to amend that to provide a uh, more full disclosure than exists under current law. And then um, with regards to Judge Kopp, it went to the board not as a prohibition but as a um, restriction. As a disclosure, that is correct. And then uh, the Quentin cop made a motion to um, make it a prohibition again at the, that meeting. That is correct. And you referred that there was no second for that. That's correct. Okay, so I understand the history. Thank you. So I'd like to um, just comment on in response to Commissioner Rennie's remarks. I think that you make a really great point that we have the opportunity here to to pass the legislation, but it's not the last opportunity that we have, that as we go forward, as these disclosure reports come in, or they don't come in, I think that would be important data for us to, to continue to review uh, as, as the um, ordinance goes into effect, and that 
if and when the deficiencies of the ordinance come to light, we have the not only the opportunity, but also the responsibility and the obligation to address that. And we have the power of the, the ballot, which is unique to us as a commission. So I think that this would be a first step and that there should be follow-ups along the way to monitor how, how well this ordinance is, uh, uh, is being implemented, enacted, and enforced. And what the, if the evils that we're trying to <coughs> to combat persist, then I think that there is uh, going to be opportunity for us to, to continue to take action. And so I don't think that should stop us today from you know, enacting and, and acting on what's before us. Um, so Commissioner Cobb, my next question to you is that is there, would, did you want to propose your amendment number two? Yes. The private right of action? Section 1.170 under the private right of action uh, to add uh, two sentences. Does everybody have those on page 13 of what staff distributed? I'll read it, it's short. In an action brought by a resident of a court enters judgment against the defendant or defendants, the resident shall Receive 25% of the amount recovered and the remaining 75% shall be deposited into the city's general fund. In an action brought by the city attorney, the entire amount recovered from the defendant or defendant shall be deposited into the city's general fund. I move that as an amendment to section 1.170. Is there a second? Well, question uh, for staff through the chair. What is the current status of the, uh, the amount that's typically awarded? I understand in, in uh, state court, not federal court necessarily, that the uh, amount um, recovered by the plaintiff or the person who brings the key TAM will call it <coughs> action is set by the judge, typically in federal court and in, in under our current statute or laws, there are no uh, percentage re rewards to the individual other than attorney's fees and expenses, correct? That is correct. So if I understand this amendment correctly, uh, Judge Kopp is asking that we set a 25% recovery amount, which includes fees, expenses, and potential um, award percentage of the award, whatever is determined by the court or the jurisdiction. Yep, correct. Um, is this a practice anywhere else in the state of California? As far uh, I, I may look for clarification from the city attorney, but the, um, the state through the Political Reform Act, which is the equivalent of our local law, which we rely on, does have a uh, citizen suit provision, which uh, does, I believe, give 50% of uh, the award or penalties. Okay. City Attorney, have anything else to say? I'm, I'm not aware of any similar rule in other jurisdictions. There may be. Uh, I just don't have the answer right in front of me. I think LA, does, Ryan. does LA have a 50%? Yeah. The other question is, uh, did this go over to the board? Uh, was this included in the language of the board? No, this would be a new proposal for the Board of Supervisors. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, my concern, again, is the same, is that this provision engendered an, a fair amount of controversy in the public hearings. Uh, and... Uh, I would be concerned if we add this, we then reopen with the Board of Supervisors a substantive issue, whereas all we're sent, when we send it back to them in, the, in accordance with the <coughs> recommendation of the staff, is that they are essentially just techno, technical changes and not changing any of the substance or not creating some uh, new condition <laughs> that may well be considered to be controversial at the board level. So I would be disposed to vote against it, even though I have no problem with the concept. 
I, I would echo your concern, Commissioner Rennie, about uh, in incorporating substantive amendments to the ordinance at this time. I think we had a joint meeting where it, we had the opportunity to discuss, you know, some of these issues. Um, but now that the board has acted and it's back in our court, I think that um, the amendments that were uh, recommended by staff uh, are not substantive in nature and that can that would not engender any any more um, concern or changes, you know, coming back from uh, the Board of Supervisors. So would um, would, uh, would would <coughs> like to see the commission, uh, you know, take that path if um, if if we if we uh, when it comes down to the vote, Commissioner Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think both of the uh, two. Uh, proposed amendments, the issues have been thoroughly discussed um, at this commission, and we've heard many testimonies from all sides, and I don't think any new information would change, you know, at least my mind. Uh, I don't see any new information from um, the staff, nor from the... <laughs> I am just concerned that we're going to continue to delay these and miss all the critical uh, deadlines. And I think Commissioner Ryan, to your point uh, earlier, the Board of Supervisors had not have not seen either of these provisions. So if if we were to pass these today, they would take them up anew uh, for the first time. Okay. So. For the, any other comments? So uh, there was a motion that Commissioner Kopp had made for uh, his second amendment on the private right of action. Is there a second? I'll second it. Got a second from Commissioner Rennie. Are there any other uh, changes or amendments that you would propose, Commissioner Kopp? No. Okay. So we'll call for public comment. Again, uh, Charlie Marsteller for the record for Friends of Ethics. The matter before the board and the joint uh, and the committee, uh, the commission's meeting with the board on the third, amendments had to be submitted three days before that meeting. The amendments that were suggested by members of this body came in after that time. So essentially the decision, as I understood it, was not to hear the motions by ethics because they didn't make the deadline. The deadline was imposed at the suggestion of the city attorney in a joint meeting that was held by all parties before that event, uh, all governmental parties. <clears throat> We passed Prop O in 2000 by an overwhelming margin. It was something like 78% of the vote. I could be wrong, but in any event on that exact number. But the point I'm making is this. This bill is no son of Prop J. This bill is the weakest bill that a collective group could ever come out with. It sounds like a bill written by a committee, and it is. The ballot initiative was written by the Oaks uh, Foundation and went on the ballot for up or down vote and it passed overwhelmingly because it was in fact robust. It was repealed by this body with a pledge that would be incorporated in the conflict of interest ordinance which was later enacted as prop, uh, I know it but I just can't remember it, I have to think fast, prop, prop J. Okay, in 2003, they did not incorporate the provisions that were in the Oaks measure that was passed overwhelmingly by the public. My point to you now is that this, in my view, is an egregious area of the law. This was codified by the FPPC in 1978 behested payments as a wrinkle, and it has grown immeasurably in San Francisco to include millions of dollars worth of big money going to special events like the America's Cup, 
We're not speaking about the little groups. And Aaron Peskin has even suggested a behested payment with a threshold of $5,000 as an exemption so that these nonprofits who provide services are not included. But I'm going to have to speak very fast. Um, I would recommend to this body that you enact this and raise this issue back at the board. Thank you. And that is the official position of FOE. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Debbie Lerman from the San Francisco Human Services Network. I, uh, I think we're at uh, a key point here. And I'm here today to urge you to adopt the ordinance as amended by the Board of Supervisors and with the uh, amendments as proposed <clears throat> by your staff um, and move it back to the board. We, I guess I have to disagree with Mr. Marsteller on one point. He, he characterized this legislation as, as significantly weak. It's a 40-page comprehensive piece of ethics reform. And as nonprofits, we have uh, worked around amendments that were very, very specific to our sector in a few places. But our, our um, concerns have been very targeted. And I, I really think that we have tried to participate in this process in a very thoughtful and principled way. And I, I want to thank the commissioners for addressing some of our concerns. We have not agreed frequently. It has been a very turbulent process, and I regret that it had to come to that. Um, this is not a kumbaya moment now. There are still things in this ordinance that we have concerns with, that we oppose, um, but we believe that the um, amendments that have been made in the sections that we're concerned about have actually made it better, um, have made it more practical with how fundraising works in real life, how the city's public-private partnerships work in real life. Um, we really believe that they ha those things have made this ordinance more workable, more practical, and better. And we believe as a package that this is good, strong, important public policy that we need to move back to the board and get in place so that the things that address elections, for example, can be implemented certainly by November, if not for June. Um, most of all today, I just want to say thank you for hearing us um, where you haven't agreed with us and haven't adopted our requests. We can still thank you for listening and considering them. And I have seen many of you struggle deeply um, with which direction to go. And we very much appreciate that. Um, so, and where you have agreed with us, um, again, we thank you for hearing that. So, we hope you'll move this forward today as amended. And I'm sure we'll be back here on other issues and, and hope that we can continue to work together in that thoughtful and principled manner. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Peter Cohen, Council of Community Housing Organizations. Uh, we've been here several times, and uh, so uh, I would mostly ditto what Debbie Lerman from Human Services Network just said. And uh, just to emphasize, thanking you all for your stamina uh, through this process. And uh, Commissioner, it's good to see you. you you've missed much of the drama. Um, but uh, it's been long and it's been challenging, but uh, a lot of the amendments have been very thoughtful and we appreciate that. And I think it was Commissioner Rennie who said you can always, you know, these things are, can be strengthened. Uh, part of what we had been so strong about is don't overreach at a time when you might end up with some unintended consequences and collateral damage. Uh, it gives us all a chance to see how it works and if we need to tighten the screw, so to speak, we can. The other thing to point out that now seems to be the opportunity that the Ethics Commission and the Board are, are sort of working more hand in hand is that the ordinance will go into effect much more quickly. Uh, and that was one of the amendments that took place two weeks ago is your original proposed measure would not have taken effect until January of 2019. It would have missed both the June and November election cycles. And we have an opportunity 
at least for those things that don't require a lot of staff work to set up new systems, to go into, into effect immediately once the mayor signs this ordinance. So you have a chance today to move it out, get it back to the board, they're ready to adopt this ordinance, get it to the mayor, get it into practice, uh, and then hopefully even the ones that require systems improvements can be put into practice much more quickly than waiting until, uh, you know, six months from now or eight months from now. So uh, we all want to see this work, uh, and hopefully the compromises that have come out of this process, if that's the right word for them, will still be for progress. And we thank you for your time, and anything we can do to, to help you in fu future work, we're here for the long haul. This is not something we're walking away from. We have the same inherent goals and interests in open and clean government that you all do too. So we're active participants in this process. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Jan Masoka. I'm the CEO of the California Association of Nonprofits, a statewide alliance of more than 10,000 nonprofit members. And um, Commissioner Chu, your, your earlier comment about this being a long journey certainly was the most understated thing I've heard in a long time. <laughs> I respect the fact that everybody here has worked to hammer out a compromise that it doesn't seem that anybody is really thrilled with, but is uh, is nonetheless perhaps the best compromise that can, can come out. What we at a state level are concerned with is the issue of the vitality of the nonprofits and how this kind of regulation can inadvertently hurt that economy. So for example, my corner store was robbed recently, the corner store where I, near where I live in San Francisco. I'm completely against ro armed robberies of corner stores. We could probably stop them by request by requiring that every person entering a corner store would have to submit identification and be frisked, and that would simply put all the corner stores right out of business. I'm afraid that in the efforts, in the well-meaning efforts to do something about corporate contributions and individual behested contributions, we are treading down a path that will, in effect, put our corner nonprofits out of business because putting any time that we put jeopardy, put volunteers and possible donors in jeopardy, we, in effect, say you have to submit ID and be frisked before you can enter this corner store. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, thanks for uh, allowing us all to give comment. And welcome, Commissioner Ryan. Nice to see you here. My name is Torn Lewis. I'm with Alliance for Justice. We're a nationwide association of nonprofits. I'm with our Oakland office, where I'm a Northern California Council. Um, without belaboring the points that my colleagues in the uh, local nonprofit community have made, I just want to similarly uh, really thank and applaud the staff and commission for your efforts over this long um, dialogue, and it really has been um, a sincere iterative, uh, iterative process, and I think every version of this uh, legislation, um, however complex it is, has always reflected um, the concerns and input of uh, the community, so we certainly appreciate that. Um, along those lines, I would uh, also like to um, uh, join my colleagues in um, respectfully uh, requesting that the legislation be moved forward so that this um, iterative process can be uh, continued um, with input from uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors. We think that this has been an extremely constructive process, um, also an innovative one, uh, you know, doing things like the joint hearing. Um, so again, we would really just like to applaud the process. We think it should continue to move forward, and uh, we appreciate all your hard work on this and think it's really <coughs> a lot of um, improvements um, toward uh, including nonprofit uh, voices and reflecting concerns in the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Anita Mayo from Pillsbury Winthrop Shop, Hitman. Just a few comments regarding some of the sections, which you've heard some of this before. 
uh, section 1.126, the ban prohibiting contributions from a city contractor unfairly extends beyond the party to the contract to board members, principal officers, and subcontractors. The pro prohibition provides a disincentive to civic-minded individuals who would otherwise serve on nonprofit boards and forces them to make a choice between service on nonprofit boards and making contributions to candidates of their choice. Section 1.161 campaign ads, as currently interpreted by the San Francisco Ethics Commission staff, the requirement for a state committee which does not file its reports with the Ethics Commission to include as a disclaimer on its ad that the committee's financial disclosures are available at the commission's website results in a false and misleading statement to the public. Section 1.161A2 should be revised to apply solely to committees that file reports with the Commission. Sections 3.203 and 3.207 create new conflict of interest provisions which are not needed since state law and regulations mandate recusal when financial interests conflict with an official's private interests. FPPC advice letters and regulations issued over the years provide much needed clarity in interpreting the conflict of interest laws. Regarding behested payments, state and San Francisco laws already regulate behested payments. Under state law, the disclosure is automatic once the financial threshold is met. The proposed legislation imposes unnecessary complications regarding when the provision would apply. Is it during the pendency of a matter? Is it six months after a final decision is made? Or is it 12 months prior to commencement? A filing of report by the official should be sufficient. It's overly burdensome to require donors and recipients to also file reports. And one can only conclude that the legislation's <coughs> intent is to discourage such donations. I recommend that you not adopt amendment number one, prohibiting behested payments is not needed given the extensive disclosure requirements. And I also recommend that you not adopt amendment number two, the authority to recover 25% of an award will simply encourage frivolous lawsuits. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> There's no other public comment, so I believe we have uh, four motions before us. Um, Uh, Madam uh, Executive Director, would you uh, call the motion and uh, we'll do a vote by roll call as we did at the joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. The first motion was uh, by Commissioner Rene, seconded by Commissioner Lee, to adopt the ordinance as amended by the Board of Supervisors on April 3rd with the recommendations contained in the staff presentation today. I'll call commissioners alphabetically. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Kopp? No. Commissioner Kopp, no. Commissioner Lee? Aye. Commissioner Lee, aye. Commissioner Rennie? Aye. Commissioner Sherenny, aye. Commissioner Ryan? Aye. Aye. That's motion carries on a four to one vote with Commissioner Kopp in the dissent. The second motion is an amendment offered by Commissioner uh, Kopp and seconded by Commissioner Chu to clarify language on uh, page seven of the ordinance, lines eight and nine, regarding uh, the use of the term elected officer. Could we clarify? Okay. The office and name. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Chu, aye. Commissioner Kopp. Aye. Commissioner Kopp, aye. Commissioner Lee. Aye. Commissioner Lee, aye. Commissioner Rene. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Rene, aye. Commissioner Ryan. Aye. Aye. Motion carries on a unanimous five to zero vote. The next motion is a motion by Commissioner Kopp, seconded by Commissioner Rene, to amend the ordinance uh, to insert the behested payments ban uh, back into the body of the ordinance, as described in his amendment circulated today. Commissioner Chu? No. Commissioner Chu, no. Commissioner Kopp? Aye. Commissioner Kopp, aye. Commissioner Lee? No. Commissioner Lee, no. Commissioner Rene? No. Commissioner Rene, no. Commissioner Ryan? No. Commissioner Rene, no. The motion fails on a four to, excuse me, a f uh, four to one vote with four members in the dissent. And the next uh, motion is a motion by Commissioner Kopp to amend section 1.170 
regarding the right of private action by a resident to allow for a 25% recovery of penalties by that resident. Uh, that was seconded by uh, Commissioner Rene. Commissioner Chu? No. Commissioner Chu, no. Commissioner Kopp? Aye. Commissioner Kopp, aye. Commissioner Lee? No. Commissioner Lee, no. Commissioner Rene? No. Commissioner Rene, no. Commissioner Ryan? No. Commissioner Ryan, no. The motion fails on a four to one vote. Uh, we do have one final motion then, which would be to adopt the ordinance as amended and forward to the Board of Supervisors. I thought, I thought that was the first motion that uh, was adopted four to one. Yeah, it was, but there was also a subsequent amendment to change some language uh, that Commissioner Kopp had raised, uh, a technical cleanup, which was also subsequently adopted. So this would now adopt the entirety of the ordinance as amended by those two motions. So I'll make a motion that we adopt the ordinance as amended by. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, the second. Yeah, there was a second from Commissioner Lee. Commissioner. Commissioner Lee. Yes, I would like uh, to be recognized. Commissioner Kopp. Uh, thank you. I will vote no on this uh, regressive ordinance. Uh, Mr. Marsteller, who has more years of experience and more time and effort than anybody on this uh, podium in this subject, uh, described the present state of a proposed law which is regressive. It is regressive from what voters passed in 2000. I uh, erroneously referred to that as Proposition J. That was Proposition O. And for those who have gotten their way, namely these uh, nonprofit association of organizations, um, they want us to vote for it. And they'll probably so state in the voters' handbook to further deceive voters in the city and county of San Francisco. They argue these changes, which they secured on a wholesale basis, have made this better. What a joke. This proposed legislation is a palliative. All the substantive requests of the nonprofits primarily have been adopted as part of it. There won't be any revisiting of uh, the law for another decade or so. Uh, 2000 was followed by the 2003 obliteration of Proposition O. It's now 2018. It'll be 2028 before a future ethics commission or the voters of San Francisco or the Board of Supervisors demand a law that stops pay to play. And that's what it is, pure and simple. I used to think that's a cliche, but it's as good a description as the English language uh, affords us. And of course, it's been changed by the Board of Supervisors. That's to be expected. They have to run for re-election or election. They have to get votes. The Ethics Commission members don't have to get votes. And that is why the law uniquely, the law establishing the Ethics Commission permits the Ethics Commission to submit directly to voters proposed changes in the law. Not as a palliative, but to stop the iniquitous practice of pay to play. And for that reason, I won't engage in fooling voters into thinking that whatever the letter of the proposition is in uh, November that this will solve the problem. I may go beyond that. 
Those are the reasons in summary form I will vote no. Commissioner Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I've said this several times, but as someone who's really benefited directly from the nonprofit service community, I started my career uh, with a wonderful nonprofit. Uh, my mom benefited from uh, nonprofit uh, service providers every day uh, for the last uh, few years of her life. Um, I don't question uh, Commissioner Cop's uh, view on, you know, his view of pay to play among certain players. Um, just like there are bad apples in the corporate world, um, I don't pretend that 100% of the nonprofits are angels, but at the same time, I must speak up to really defend the thousands of um, service providers who work in the nonprofit sector who do not get um, decent salaries, long hours, very, very difficult circumstances with the very um, passionate belief that they are doing a common good for, this, for the city um, and for the residents of this city. And I think that um, for them, they do have a voice. They do represent a community who do not have a voice in the city's um, policy and legislative making process. And if that is being perceived as pay to play, then I salute them. I salute them for standing up um, on behalf of the clients, on behalf of the community. And, and I think that there may be ways to uh, really rein in uh, other folks who under the guise of nonprofit take advantage of it, but they're paying the dedicated um, community service providers, and they are leaders in our community, in our city, to paint them in such a broad brush, and I think that is a disservice to Commissioner Rennie. Uh, I think all of us would like legislation that would legislate money out of politics. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't do it. And there is no simple legislation that can deal with the problems uh, that exist because of the fact that money influences elections. We hear talk about Prop O. Prop O was declared unconstitutional in part. So it was fine that the board, that the Ethics Commission passed, created Prop O, but it became a nullity, partly because the court said it was a violation of the Constitution. And I th would commend the staff, and I commend all the people who met at public, uh, at public meetings who were seriously concerned about trying to deal with the question of money in politics and how can we eliminate its influence as much as possible and stay within the law. And I don't disagree with, the, with Commissioner Kopp that uh, this bill isn't as strong as I might have liked it to be, but it is a step in the right direction. It sends a message, and I see no reason why uh, the commission can't continue to be vigilant and propose additional uh, uh, regulations or rules that will hopefully uh, at least moderate the influence that these enormous sums of money are that float around in, in elections. But it's, it's a complex problem, not something that can say, well, it's too weak and we shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't have done it. We've sent a message and we are continuing to work on it and I, I think we're moving in the right direction. <clears throat> Uh, Commissioner Rennie, I would uh, like to associate myself with your remarks, and I would agree, and I think that there's always um, 
room to for improvement, and I think it's always onwards and upwards. So I think um, we have on the floor a motion that was seconded to approve the ordinance as we just amended it and to send it to the Board of Supervisors. So Madam Executive Director, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Chu votes aye. Commissioner Kopp? No. Commissioner Kopp votes no. Commissioner Lee? Aye. Commissioner Lee votes aye. Commissioner Rene? Aye. Commissioner Rene, aye. Commissioner Ryan? Aye. Commissioner Ryan, aye. The motion to approve the ordinance as amended and return it to the Board of Supervisors is approved on a four-fifths vote with one dissent, uh, Commissioner Kopp in the dissent. Thank you. So, the next item on our agenda is agenda item five, additional opportunity for public comment on matters appearing or not appearing on the agenda <coughs> pursuant to Ethics Commission Bylaws Article 7, Section 2. No, no public comment? All right. Motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Adjourned.